when we look at California or Nevada, I have the pleasure of looking at four states because I have product in them and I get to see what type of testing that is being required and being done or what's available. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, when we talk about taking it down a uh, pharmaceutical pathway, coming up with the ideal dosage forms, we're not even using the right terms for the dosage forms that we're using. There is an edible in the pharmacopoeia. <laughs> um, we've looked to high times as the expert uh, defining the dosage forms, which as a PharmD, I find, you know, the same, the same issue that government and regulators um, are following, which is a non-science-based, non-industry standard, and they try and come up with, you know, new terms and stuff. So I, so when we, when I think about trying to create a product and realize that I can't look at those actives, 9 CBD, 8 THC, 8 CBN. All they are is, is uh, grouped into these um, 9 to 13 cannabinoids that we may have the ability to look at, some that are in the neutral form and some that are in the active form. I all I do is sit back and go, my words, I, we, we, we have to start somewhere. That's why I started doing observational longitudinal studies and then try and get pe people to, to uh, consider throwing in a placebo and do a crossover so we can start getting some data, get it published, and, and, and then start the questions, start the you know, the, the interest and drive towards products that would be valuable. If you take a active and you put it into a suppository, the same dose you put in, you leave in an oil and take it orally. You put it into a tincture, and a true tincture is an ethanol-based solution, um, and take that sublingually, or you put it into a, a buckle route or a topical route, these different routes of administration will have a profound effect on the clinical outcome that that individual patient experiences. That surrounded my first couple patents in neuropathic pain using topical ketamine with or without an anesthetic to deal with severe cases, types of neuropathic pain. You didn't get any of the side effects that you got from taking ketamine in any other route of administration. It changed the picture. We have the same series of issues that we need to address with this over 500 active physiologic chemicals that are in a whole plant extract or in the whole plant for that matter. Six, eight weeks ago said they believe 70 to 78 percent of MDs believe medical cannabis is effective personally. But they are under an extreme amount of pressure never to say that in public. Can you, can you give me that? Well, the, the pressure that they're under is, is real, some of it's self-inflicted in terms of they they think it's okay, they don't think it's going to do any harm, but they look at it and, you know, and I have friends and they won't recommend it and there's two, two main reasons. One, they have an overriding fear of it being a Schedule One drug and the DEA coming in and pulling their license, looking at their medical history, their medical records, etc., and having a problem in the future prescribing anything, which is false. I mean, there hasn't been a DEA prosecution of a physician in, since it, happened in California, I think it was 15 years ago, and they really haven't had anything like that happen to them with their licensing. The other thing is they don't want to be known as a pot doc. So if you're an orthopedic surgeon or whatever type of physician you are, and you start doing recommendations for patients, the word gets out to your referral base and to your other physicians saying, 
this is Dr. So-and-so, he's just a pot duck. He's giving patients cannabis, and anyone who doesn't believe in that it helps will stop referring patients to them. And so there's that issue as well. They want to be educated. They're starting to get more into the conversations about it, but it takes educating them. And like, as I mentioned before, the doctors want to get educated, and they're starting to get more information so they can give the proper advice to patients about cannabis. Because the patients are coming in and saying, I'm on this antihypertensive or this medication. How is cannabis? I'm taking it. I'm going to take it, like an oncology person like Donald Abrams, he, they, they give, it works for neuropathic pain. It, will it work to cure their cancer? And he flat out will say no, there's no way. And I absolutely feel that it works in a petri dish. Does it translate into someone taking this for metastatic breast cancer? Well, no, I'll, I'll never say that it cures cancer. However, if an oncologist says, well, is it, a patient says, is it okay for me to take it in conjunction with my oncologic treatment? then that's a whole different story. And, and oncology guys are the, probably the premier specialists who push cannabis to be able to be used as an anti-nausea and vomiting medication because of the chemo, as well as the fact it probably is not gonna hurt to take it with your chemo or whatever other, medic whatever other solutions that they're offered for their cancer. It's not coming from us, uh, from the physicians or people who are uh, sort of in the business of cannabis. It's coming from the users. The pressure is coming from the public. And why? Because the public sees the benefit. Uh, there has not been any concerted campaign, to my knowledge, by anybody in the cannabis business to convince the public that they should take cannabis. They have been there because the public comes to them and says, I want the cannabis. Uh, there has been no campaign educating the public uh, why it is useful because everybody is afraid uh, to do it. Uh, this has been the most uh, active grassroots movement that you will ever see, which is just driven by individual people. Uh, <clears throat> the second thing I'll say is the opiate, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I don't want to so sound macabre or something, is uh, in the long run is going to be very beneficial for the country because it will loosen the grip of the DEA and a whole reappraisal of the drug policy that uh, you can't just put uh, drugs in, in class one on whimsical basis. You had to have a good evidence. You just can't do it because Arlen uh, thought that uh, with the prohibition over, his department will be closed down, so let me find something else. Uh, to go after, and uh, he lied through his teeth. He lied through the uh, to the Senate uh, committee. Uh, if he was alive today, he should have been brought up uh, for perjury, not f on one perjury charge, but uh, a multitude of perjury charges. Mm -hmm, and that? yet, nobody wants to revisit it. Is the pressure from the public is coming, where government is very <laughs> reluctantly giving little bit, little bit, little bit uh, concession here and there. If somebody thinks that it's being done from the influence of, quote, the marijuana lobby, if such a lobby exists, I have not seen it, and I haven't seen their effectiveness. The lobby is the people. The lobby is the user. The attorneys, especially the uh, people in the legislature, I mean, Rohrbach or Farr, as of December, is going to be gone unless it's voted back in and put into any bills, which essentially means with the DEA is that the cuffs are off dollar-wise, and so the DEA will be able to go after, spend money and will be able to go after, if they want to, um, anyone producing cannabis and CBD. So if you have your legislatures or whatever in, you know, in, in Congress to say, listen, bring this back and reenact it, it's going to be possibly devastating because uh, Mr. Sessions has been quite vocal in saying, I'd love to go after people, I just can't spend any money. Now, if this absolutely fails December 31st, there'll be no problem. December 8th. December 8th, I'm sorry. There was a similar thing that happened when pharmacy and pharmacists decided to take back their secunda martum, which was really in compounding. We were compounders. We compounded for 70 years tinctures of cannabis and was one of the top three prescriptions that were dispensed in the United States from 1850 until 
37. Yeah, 37, when the Tax Act went into effect. Kind of tapered off before then, but um, it was still substantial. So in the compounding pharmacy arena, patients were the ones that, again, drove a lot of the business because they'd go talk to their doctor and say, this isn't working, or that medication has an excipient or something in it, or the dose is wrong, or the route of administration is wrong, and my compounding pharmacist can fix it. And so that was a, a driving force. There was a lot of drug companies that attempted to suppress that activity uh, on a, a professional level. So if GW Pharma comes in, gets their uh, drug approval for Epidiolex, a pure CBD product for um, uh, Gervais, epilepsy, that, epilepsy that's uh, you know, treatment resistant, they will use the same platform that every other drug company has used. If you get your finger in the door, your toe in the door, then it opens up wide for off-label prescribing. So they'll use it for off-label prescribing, and all of us are sitting back as professionals wondering, how is that going to impact this thriving, massively growing CBD market in the United States and around the world? I have not looked, and I'm not aware of any data like in Germany or something, where, where uh, GW Pharma has gotten through the FDA. I think they're, they have several, um, at least 24 uh, countries that utilize their product, uh, or Sativex, which is a one-to-one -one ratio, uh, whole plant extract. You are talking to the person who has over 800 patents claim issued by the U.S. Patent Office and I'm trying to enforce them. I think going to hell and back would be easier than, than enforcing a patent. And uh, so the point is, in their case, they, they're not even a patent and approval by the FDA. You make slight change, you add another compound to it. Uh, they have no way of enforcing uh, <coughs> the, uh, the FDA approval. Well, that's how pharmacies have have been able to circumvent a identical product yeah. is by putting in other actives it, it or some a, or routes of administration. It may be an inert product, but it's a different product. I agree uh, with you. you. Know, legally, it becomes a different product. Well, let me play. Let me play the devil's advocate completely on this. Okay. Not 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 that I believe it, but a, a case could be made. Now we were talking before about unique consistency and testing in getting a compound approved through mice, FDA, etc. Now here you have a company, GW, that has done exactly that. They have a consistent, always 100% consistent compound that they're going to promote probably uh, for, for uh, intractable seizures and possibly other people will be using it for other things. Is that so bad? In other words, you have, you have a product that's consistent across the board, across the country. You know exactly what it is when you get it versus someone saying, well, here's a CBD product from this manufacturer, here's something from this guy, here's something from this guy. We don't think we know what's in it because they're telling us that's what they studied. Is it really what's in it? Because there's no consistent no. testing. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there as no, no. to incite answer, some riot. I let like me it. answer you. Anything which limits people's choice is bad. There's a cardinal principle. In any free society, the choice is the most important thing. And if you find some way of uh, compromising or so, uh, that choice, you are not doing a favor. And uh, number one. Number two, the, uh, the consistency that I was talking about, when you, you have 545 uh, biologically active molecules as of this date from marijuana, and on those 545, you combine, they may have one molecule. You can combine five molecules. It will be a consistent product, but it will be a different product. But the point is, you will have an alternate product, and you can even claim that our product is better because it has more uh, uh, biologically active molecule in it, but every time you'll buy it, you'll get the same thing. And let me tell you, GW may be doing it now, 
but a lot of uh, other organizations will be soon doing it. And if it is done by a number of them, there would be a competition and the price would be kept in check. You cannot give a monopoly to G GW uh, to start acting like the big pharma. Their stock price is indicating that uh, the Wall Street believes that they will have monopoly. I'm, I'm betting on it. Uh, as soon as uh, their stock goes above 130, I short it. When you have 545 compounds to choose from, and they are going after one compound, we'll have three, four, five compounds, and say our product is superior to theirs, and it's not the same product because the combination, there is a, a un, uh, <coughs> unequivocal evidence that one compound potentiates the effects of the other compound. Is the media ready to stand up to pharma, or is there too much money in those two-minute ads to make it happen? If it's the story of the day and people will watch, then they'll do it. Like smoking, uh, uh, nicotine smoking. Well, anything that anything that promotes people watching whatever they're showing on television, they'll want. Now, the opioids is the story of the day, Got it. and so hopefully this will propagate, pop, propagate, and more stories of it will come out until the next news cycle when something else more important comes up. But yeah. hopefully this will get into the public's eye a little bit more and more mainstream press, because every time you see an article, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, anything about the opioid epidemic, cannabis is never, ever mentioned, uh, ever, unless it's a kind of a, quote, alternative newspaper or magazine. Um, mainstream, except for Sunday, and that had to do with legislation, not so much right. cannabis per se, it was the FDA. So it, in a way, yes, it did reflect cannabis, but I hopefully this will, more new mainstream will pick up on it because you read article after article in these mainstream papers talk about, yes, it's a terrible epidemic, yes, we should do more money, yes, we should do this, but they don't mention how to fix it. They have their own uh, issues. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're angels or they're... Uh, the thing they die for is their audience, size of their audience. Yeah, of course. Anything which will increase the size of their audience, they will do it is the politician who can be bought, an individual politician who is in that position, like they bought the two uh, prison presidential candidate with less than $180 million, so n uh, there was no action since then. And I suspect the same thing happened with Obama. I think that same thing will happen with Trump. They've come and speaking very loudly how much uh, the, the drugs are costing and they are going to change it. Well, guess what? Nothing happens. Because it's easy to buy a small group of people, as opposed to the uh, publications and uh, media, which has a very wide population, and their first priority is how do we increase our readership. Basically what they're saying, if people want it, people benefit from it. There's good evidence that people benefit. Why is it illegal? Uh, because the DEA law doesn't uh, make something which is useful you cannot put it uh, on any schedule. Following the report in January from the National Academy of Sciences indicating unequivocal evidence for its use in chronic pain in adults, things weren't picked up by any of the medical associations or organizations uh, you know, mentioning it. Shortly, a couple months after uh, that release of data, there was the first ever uh, opiate uh, crisis summit um, as part of the American Pharmacists Association's annual convention. So for a day, they talked about the crisis. They talked about the overdose. They talked about options for uh, uh, substance abuse, um, withdrawal treatments, and not and chronic pain, and not one speaker talked at all about the use of cannabis. I had to bring up the study, uh, or the report from the American Academy of Sciences, um, and ask them questions. And, you know, they looked around, um, it, was, it, was, it was embarrassing. In the study that we did with Berkeley in pain, we saw a marked decrease in people smoking and an increase in vapor, vaping and tinctures. Um, you know, there's never been something to show that cannabis smoke per se causes lung cancer. I mean, that's been, that's been um, uh, debunked completely. 
Um, I think, though, people will start doing more just because in the states you mentioned, uh, you know, people aren't allowed to do it. I respectfully disagree. Okay. Uh, we didn't know about uh, tobacco causing lung cancer for centuries. So is it the night is still young, uh, or the time is not present past, because the med marijuana plant has the same radioactive substances which are also found in tobacco. And also there are lipids which are harmful to the, uh, uh, for the person. There are a whole series of uh, <coughs> plant material which is unhealthy. That is why the concentrate and having the ability to sm uh, smoke the concentrate or vapors is, uh, is the thing that we should be talking about as an education to the public at large. Because mark my word, the pharmaceutical company will come in and say, wait a minute, these guys are giving you cancer. Uh, because they are uh, asking you to smoke uh, or recommending that you smoke marijuana, uh, which has uh, radioactive substances similar to tobacco. So it's not only just a question of consistency, it's also a question this delivery is very critical. It's also important for the consistency, for the safety, for predictability. There's a, a, a factor that's being overlooked here, though. We already have um, a substance uh, when you uh, extract it selectively, in which you can have anywhere from one to hundreds of different uh, active materials. When you burn that, you ha add to that all of the combustion products, which are almost random from combustion chemistry, and you, and you increase um, uh, an already chaotic situation so that it, it becomes even more difficult to find the signal from the noise in terms of benefits or risks. So I think that um, FDA is probably um, uh, noticing this, pushing very hard on finding ways to inhale aerosols that aren't burnt or vaping instead of combustion and uh, sublingual because it's a more selective pathway. Um, and so I think the worry is that we will, um, we will suffer from chaos, not only in the science of trying to understand the things we're trying to get in a beneficial way for people, but also in the behavior of people who are already suspicious of government disrespectful of authority with good reason. And uh, the problem is not that pharmacy will do, um, will swoop in and will completely monopolize the situation. The risk to me is more that we will have people resort to uh, <coughs> trade secrets and not publishing things and not telling us what they have done rather than patenting it because already we don't get patents in China for good reason, because the Chinese do not respect a licensee, and they are pirates. And so we have already uh, a not especially um, orderly market of people who think that they owe anybody else anything for a license on a patent that you get, even for a very good and very reliable product. Someone once asked me that, you know, hemp and plant-based CBD, you know, is, is there a difference? And I, sometimes I equate it to water. I mean, water's chemical is H2O. And it's H2O if it's in Evian, it's if H2O if it comes from your tap. It's, no matter where it is, it's H2O. It's what's added to it that makes the difference. So, you know, what, what, with the, the plant-based, there's other things that are in it, unless these people are adding other things as well that differenti your pro differentiates your product with the others. When we talk about everything should go to an extracted product that is standardized, it still brings up the issues of what extraction method was used. We already have seen data again coming from Mir showing that there is significant, using the same material, different extraction methods will demonstrate a different chemical profile that is included in that whole plant extract. But if we use the same methodology every time, 
you can get a consistent product. We uh, come right back to the yeah. original question of, you know, what's the right form, the right product, the right strain, and being able to make that godly decision. No. Uh, I think so by the time you reach the distillate, you don't care what strain it was, because it will have the basic compounds that you... Uh, I do appreciate the comment, but yeah. I still think there's more that we don't understand. Well, what we don't understand is how uh, any variation in the methodology will impact it, which it can. I, I concede that point. I'm, I agree with that point. But the point is, if you keep your methodology uniform, you can produce a consistent product. Now, you may not want to do it because you want to experiment, you want to, or the cost of the way you do it is uh, higher, so you find another alternate which is uh, less costly, but it will have an impact beyond just uh, the uh, lower cost. I just think that there's components of the plant and their yin and yang relationship, turning on and turning off switches, um, impacting binding uh, uh, ability, all of these things, I don't believe we have a good understanding of any of that. And if you don't think that they're studying strains in secret farms about what's going to be best, you're out of your mind. I mean, they're, they're apt I, I, can't, I don't have any evidence to prove it, but how they would not be would be a stupid business decision on, on their part. Um, not to be growing strains for, and, and I think geneticists, in the genetic part of People and individual plants is going to pay, play a bigger and bigger, bigger, bigger um, role in a, con a specific product for a specific condition. There are companies, uh, uh, genom uh, some genomics, I'm blocking on the name in Boston, who are looking specifically at human genome and seeing if there's a difference in people who have chronic, chronic pain lasting a long time and what can possibly be done with a specific genetic strain of cannabis. And they're mapping this as we speak. And so I think the genetics part of it is going to be a big issue down the road in terms of finding a specific product to help one specific person, not just a general group of medical conditions. That's still way down the road, but I think that's going to happen at some point in time. It will also help by excluding individuals from getting exposed to certain components because uh, that may be right. Augment can't breast cancer or something. Correct. Well, the food industry is one that uh, hasn't been mentioned very much, but certainly as we look at artificial foods and gene editing, it's harder to do in plant materials than it is in animal uh, systems. Uh, but uh, gene editing and genetic modification will not be ignored in all of this and may make some of the most profound changes that we can even imagine. But the <coughs> question is, uh, it's personalized medicine. You know, the other word for it is yeah. personalized. Uh, individualized or personalized medicine, whichever word you like. Uh, but it's going to be a very costly process. So it's not only who is in the business, but who has the deep, deep pockets to do it, because you are not going to come up with something for at least for 10, 15 years. And at 10, 15 years, we'll have to spend very heavily doing all the things that uh, we have talked about here. So that is why I said tobacco companies are flush with cash. Similarly, the farmer is uh, flush with cash. They, they have the capability. Walmart's problem is uh, that they are always struggling against Amazon, and Amazon is a kid struggling against them. I can't think that Walmart would take 20, 30 billion dollars a year to develop something which may turn up in 10 years. Uh, so the chances are it will be one of these companies uh, w which have a very robust cash flow, which can afford to spread billions of dollars without any question.